Hello learners, now that we completed lesson 1, the issues of death of common man, let us look into lesson 2 in which John Dunn through his last sermon, Death's Duel, gives us an elaborate explanation of the issues of death of God. Life and death are two inevitable aspects of nature. God loves his creation immensely. In order to prove this, he became a mortal being, that is Jesus Christ, and suffered the pangs of death like a mortal being. By this, he indicated that his way to save us is to die for us. The followers of Jesus Christ felt great disillusionment, confusion and anguish on the day their Lord and Saviour was dead. Not only did they experience the loss of a dear friend, but for a time they too experienced a loss in their faith. God seemed to be silent. But slowly they understood that he decided to take the sins of the world on his shoulders so that we might gain forgiveness for our sins and forge a new relationship with the one true God through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Of course, it is strange to contemplate that the Lord of life could die. Just as it is strange to think of the drying of the Red Sea, the sun standing still, the lions being hungry but not biting. These are the examples of some impossible things like the death of God. But God chose to send his son as Christ and the latter had to die because of his love for humanity. After the death of Jesus, the disciples did not concoct some outlandish plan to steal the body and proclaim that he had been resurrected. They did not even anticipate the resurrection. They fully expected that the corpse to decay and return to the dust. It was only seeing him on that Sunday following his death subsequently for 40 days that generated their faith in the Lord. This is extremely powerful circumstantial evidence of the genuine resurrection of the Saviour's body. Many years before the coming of Jesus Christ, the prophet Isaiah gives us an incredibly rich and accurate description of Christ's eventual death. He not only includes the ways in which Jesus would suffer, but also why he had to suffer. This reference is quoted by Dunn in his sermon. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, within a virgin woman named Mary, Jesus was born in a barn, a far cry from the mighty king that Israel was hoping would save them from their Roman conquerors. Aside from many miracles concerning his birth and early childhood, Jesus' life went almost unnoticed until the age of 30. After he was baptized, he started showing miracles, which made the rulers furious. They misunderstood his preaching and concluded that he was claiming himself as God. So they plotted to kill Jesus. Jesus was tried in front of the ruling Jewish body and found guilty of blasphemy, claiming to be God. The following day, he was brought to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. He was charged by the chief priest and elders 
with insurrection which is punishable only by death. It was Pillage's custom to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd during the Passover feast. Since Pilate could find no guilt in Jesus, he offered to free Jesus. However, the leaders of the Jews persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Later, Jesus was crucified on a cross. Above his head hung the inscription, Here is Jesus, King of the Jews. Much to the chagrin of the Jewish leaders, if he would have wished to escape from such a calamity, he could have done it. But to prove that he was in tune with God, he chose to die. He wanted to show that despite his divine power and authority, he submitted his very life to God the Father. The death of Jesus Christ was the ultimate in humility, the ultimate in love, the ultimate in doing what was right, no matter what the cost. Now we will see the painful death of God, which was taken as a joy by him. A biblical character called David felt that God was the God of revenges and he would not spare anyone from death, punishments and revenge, even his son. He has free will. He punishes and spares whom he will. Surprisingly, love is stronger than death. Christ was baptized out of love. His love is determined only in accepting death, but not in his agony or in his sufferings. His bleeding through his eyes, pores and thorns pricking his body. This was his contract with his father. This decree, the necessity of dying, was an eternal decree. Infinite love and eternal love are as eternal as liberty and the painful death of Christ was considered as a bruise by his father. He was waiting for baptism. He was in pain till it was accomplished. This baptism was his death. The Holy Ghost calls it a joy, a joy in the midst of his torments. And he rose from the same later. He calls this joy as a cup of joy, which gives health to the world if drunk. David, a prophet, is ready to take that cup as it is the cup of salvation. But by doing so, he feels that God has proved that love alone redeems the world and Christ has died for our salvation. The Jewish leaders were determined to kill Jesus. They accused him of blasphemy and got him arrested. A Roman governor named Pilate tried to rescue Jesus. He wanted to release Jesus. But when the Jews threatened to riot, Pilate condemned Jesus to death on a cross. Dunn described the death of Jesus as crucifixion. Jesus was sentenced to death by crucifixion. He was beaten 
by the Roman soldiers, scourged, stripped and nailed to a cross inhumanly. He was crucified between two robbers and died. After crucifixion, his body was placed in the new tomb of a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus had promised the disciples that he would come back after his death. His enemies knew this so to prevent anyone from stealing the body they had soldiers guard the tomb of Jesus. Saint Matthews and Saint Mark both great prophets talked of his death which was to be accomplished in Jerusalem. They compared the journey of wilderness of Israelites with the Christ passing of mankind through the sea of blood. Elias was considered to be the figure of ascension. There are evidences from the Bible that Jesus was crucified and died. Also evidences that Jesus predicted his own crucifixion and death. The predictions say that Jesus was not afraid to die. In fact, he predicted his own death and resurrection. If we refer to Matthew 16, 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law and that he must be killed on the third day be raised to life. In Luke 18, 31 and 32, Jesus took 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him and kill him. And on the third day he will rise again. Also, John 12, 30 and 32 says this voice was for your benefit not mine now is the time for judgment on this world and the prince of this world will be driven out but I when I am lifted up from the earth will draw all men to myself he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die and the scriptures also say that Jesus willingly went to the cross. Matthew 26, 53, it says, Do you not think I cannot call on my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But how then? Would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Also in Matthew 26, 39, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. All the above references were given to you for strengthening and emphasizing on the death of Jesus and resurrection. Romans show 
a lot of aversion towards the name of death. But when they saw the death of Christ and they believed in it, it was proved by Romans that Christ died only for our salvation and the same was written as essence of their scriptures by Elias and Moses. These scriptures need to be read for edification and not for the sake of curiosity about how one attained death. It is proved by Peter that one should not entertain a vain imagination of immortality and immutability as God also experienced death. From the hour of the Passover until he died, Christ prayed for several hours and he spent his time in communion with God. It was a prayer accomplished with readiness to shed blood for the Lord's glory. The Jews held a council early in the morning and confirmed his death. They took him to Pilate to justify their stance. All the innocence of Christ was depicted as sins. Pilate gave judgment towards noon and by noon out of haste they executed Christ upon the cross. The sacred body the body of salvation, the body of immense love, hung on the cries, rebaptized in his own tears, and sweat embalmed in his own blood alive. His words indicated bowels of compassion. His glorious eyes grew faint in their sight. Even the sun was ashamed of surviving them and departed with his light. That was the way Jesus was put on the cross. On the third day after Jesus died, an angel descended and the soldiers fled. The disciples came and found an empty tomb. Jesus had risen from the dead. He later appeared to many believers, commanding them to teach and baptize others. God out of love and compassion took the form of man to save humanity. Unfortunately, man with his sinful pursuits and egoistic material world could not understand the essence of the love of God and put him to death. The Son of God, who was never from among us, came to be one of us, but man could not estimate his immortal nature and bound him to be mortal. After all, perfection cannot be found in this imperfect world. There are various interpretations of the death of Jesus and also witnesses to struggle to make meaning out of the act of evil that brought Jesus' earthly life and mission to such an abrupt and cruel end. However, we make sense of this human tragedy. It is imperative that we see it first and foremost as a tragedy. Then of course, we may well recognize that God can and does overturn evil and convert it into good. This is what came to be called in the Christian tradition, the law of the cross. Nonetheless, God does not condone evil, let alone 
require it in order to fulfill the divine plan of salvation. The suffering and the death of Jesus, along with all other instances of violence and murder, are ultimately outside the powers of rational explanation. The most we can do is to acknowledge in faith that the mystery of God's love is finally more powerful than evil and death. The death of Jesus too needs to be recognized in this light. The prozoic style which was adopted by John Donne, which happens to be the fundamental structural device of John Donne's sermon, that is the paradox. In almost all his writings, both secular and devotional, John Donne often employed paradox which is regarded as his great achievement. There is a tendency to consider him as one of the first major English authors in discovering the possibilities of paradox as a fundamental structural device. The paradoxical quality of his writing is in accordance both with Christian theology and his poetical gifts. Dunn's sermons reveal the appropriateness of the paradoxical structure for the theopoetic and homolytic function. He invites highly individual paradoxes while wrestling with the unavoidable paradoxes of human history. Dunn's bold paradoxes encourage the pursuit of perfection in the hope of salvation, thus serving as a dramatic embodiment of highest spiritual aspirations. God, out of love and compassion, took the form of man to save him. Instead of appreciating this, man with his sinful pursuits and attachments to the materialistic positions could not understand the essence of the love of God and so put him to brutal death by crucifying him. This God, the immortal God, was never from among us, we being mortal beings, and came to be one of us to make us immortal. But we, we men, instead made him as immortal as we are. When God created the earth, he breathed his soul into the first Adam. Now this second Adam breathed his soul into God and into the hands of God. Dan concludes this lengthy sermon by expecting that at least after death he would reach that blessed dependency and lie down in peace in his grave till he faced his resurrection to a kingdom which is of inestimable price and which no man can reach. Thus the sermon, Death's Duel, explains the meaning of a good life followed by a just death which reiterates Dunn's faith in the Almighty and instills this faith in those who heard him preach this sermon and those who have read it down the ages. Learners, now let us conclude the second part of the sermon that is the issues of death of God. We discussed at length the issues of death of Jesus Christ which made who wanted to be an immortal 
an immortal being. We made him mortal. John Donne requests God to give him a death which would make him always with God an eternal life of salvation. Thank you.